So, introduction. Uh, oil and gas companies have a certain challenge. We're basically uh, uh, quite a, a low reserve replacement ratio. It's significantly less than one. The last number I saw was about 72%. Uh, it changes. And they need to increase production and replace the declining reserves. And so their response has been, I witnessed the huge increase in demand for towed streamers recently, the uh, accelerate the pace of uh, exploration in new areas. But there's a very old adage in the oil industry that the best place to actually produce oil is where you've already found it. So they need to improve recovery from existing and producing fields and revisit older areas with new technology. And I'm going to argue that, especially when we look at appraisal and development, the ocean bottom seismic data particularly, uh, it's two forms, two components, which is basically the uh, acoustic version gives you better data quality for appraisal and development. And the, the 4C data, the elastic version, actually can provide data where toad streamer fails. So this slide is actually taken from uh, the Norwegian Petroleum Directory. It's a couple of years old. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you can't read the text. Uh, but, but basically, all the stuff in the sort of you know, slightly uh, murky brown with the light, light uh, color above the line positive axis is actually the oil that's going to be left behind in the ground. Uh, the grey is the produced oil as per, and this is for the Norwegian sector, for the NPD's Norwegian Petroleum Director. Uh, for all the different fields in Norway, some of the, some of the big ones, you've got uh, Troll and uh, uh, Osseberg, Gulfax. Okay. Brown is the remaining oil reserves, but we're leaving behind just about as much as we've produced uh, in Norway, and this applies to most mature basins. And this was a uh, quote from Gunnar Berger, who was the Director General of the uh, NPD just over two years ago. Uh, he said, it's surprising to learn that under existing economic and operating conditions, and of course those are elastic, uh, only a third of the oil in place is discovered, in discovered fields is expected to, produce, to be produced globally. If we can improve recovery rate from all these fields by only 1%, that would be equivalent to 26 billion barrels of oil and that represents five years of oil consumption in the US. So real, real, we saw that as a real opportunity. So why, why would you want to acquire ocean bottom data? Ian made the comment earlier, ocean bottom data is much more expensive than tonne stream. Well, basically, you get the following. You get better signal-to-noise ratio. I'm going to show some examples of each of these. You get better wider bandwidth data. You can record the so-called full wave field that Paul discussed uh, previously. You can get any offset you want. And as you look deeper and deeper into the ground, you need longer and longer offsets. And in producing areas where there are many, many instructions in, in, in the survey area, it becomes impossible to do some of these very fancy multi-azimuth uh, streamer geometries. And you can get true full azimuth data, as opposed to the MTO, more than one azimuth data, that is achieved with the, even the, uh, they provide very nice data examples. They are still very limited in their azimuth distribution compared to what you can get with ocean bottom cable data, ocean bottom data. And as I say, you can actually image data where code streamer fails. And all in all, the physics is just generally better. And so this is uh, background noise levels. This is from data, data comparison from the Gulf of Mexico uh, with a uh, 8 kilometer, 9 kilometer toad streamer, uh, pretty much state of the art a couple of years ago, showing the uh, variations, 2D survey, just showing the variation in the RMS amplitudes of the noise encountered during the survey compared to an overlap survey with the vector size ocean system that we use. And basically what you see, the, the, the dark blue here is about 2 microbars, the yellow goes up to about 20, 25 microbars. Uh, you see a much more homogeneous noise environment with the sensor being stationary on the seafloor. Um, you get wider band of data. Uh, and again, this is the data comparison from that noise example where you see data being processed identically. The processing parameters for the two sections that you see uh, have been derived from the total streamer data on the left, your left, uh, and apply uh, to the uh, ocean bottom data on the right. Uh, the only difference really is the dual sensor summation. And what you can't read here, the, the spectral uh, displays in the bottom here, 
This is 60 hertz here, this is 90 hertz here. We get much better line response. Uh, and I gave a talk on this ACG a couple of years ago. Uh, but we, we do see much, much better re resolution uh, because of the wider bandwidth at both the low and the high ends uh, from uh, ocean bottom cable data. Uh, again, full wave field it allows you to uh, ignore the uh, poor fluid content. And the data example was from uh, SEG a few years ago, uh, gas cloud uh, survey, uh, so called gas clouds in the Gulf of Mexico, where the P wave data is obscured, attenuated uh, by the uh, fluid contents of the, the gas in the overburden, whereas the converter wave data, PS, P down, S back, shows you the fault. It's like a large fault. This is actually going right through the middle of the <coughs> producing field. So, um, and of course, with uh, say any offsets, uh, any azimuths can be achieved. This, this data is actually close to the BP. Um, it's quite trivial to show. It's actually difficult to show a, a slide showing any offset geometry because it's so, so obvious. But the orthogonal geometries that can be achieved, uh, the two orthogonal geometries that can be achieved with OBC uh, are illustrated here. And basically, we've got some data on the left is 3D toast streamer, which was 60 fold with 12 and a half meter station spacing. And then some 2D OBC shot swath, uh, again uh, with uh, 25 meter station spacing, 45 fold data. And then the orthogonal OBC shot uh, with 25 meter station spacing and only 35 fold data. So you've got about a quarter of the data density on the orthogonal OBC that you have on the toast streamer. This works, the zoom up here shows that although the field had actually been discovered, until the OBC data started to show that you can see the base of the reservoir in here, the field wasn't given any sanction because this was the best that could be achieved from public streamer in the survey area. And this was the orthogonal OBC uh, result here. So about a quarter of the data density, half the fold. Uh, and uh, I think it was mentioned by uh, uh, CG, Mr. Taylor, CG presentation, CG Veritas, sorry. Um, nice presentation, by the way. The, uh, the land guys have known this for a long time. And uh, the secret of this is really, really rate path diversity. And the fact that you have a non linear contribution in terms of to the CMP gather output, in terms when you have an orthogonal spread compared with a, a swap or inline spread. And there's a paper taken from uh, Leading Edge about 10 years ago that goes through this. And I said, land guys have known this for many years. Uh, it's just a stream folk uh, tradition and picked up on it. Because what you have is, is if you look at the, the offset contributions uh, in, a, in an inline gather, conventional uh, 2D uh, shoot, swap shoot, uh, the nearest third offsets contribute a third to the sac response and so on linearly throughout the gather. Uh, when you look at it as an orthogonal spread, the uh, first uh, not only the first off third offset range only gives you one ninth of the fold. The second offset range uh, gives you three ninths of the fold or a third of the fold. But the majority of the fold actually comes from the furthest offsets. And when you've got when you've got complex overburden geologies, then uh, it's this ray path diversity. If you can get the velocities right, that actually allows you to provide better images at lower fold. So, uh, imaging where a toad streamer fails, uh, carbonate reservoirs fracture orientation and density quite clearly. Uh, for carbonate reservoirs, this is particularly important, both onshore and offshore, by using the fast and slow shear waves and, and the, the biorefringence that occurs with the uh, shear wave energy uh, to allow you to map uh, fracture orientation and density. Uh, by mapping VPVS ratios away from the borehole, you can actually start to do reservoir characterization to predict pathology and fluid uh, away from the boreholes, which you can't do with just using P wave only data. Um, quite clearly, when you've got very, very heavy obstructions in the survey area, especially for 4D, uh, it's impossible, with, with, difficult if not impossible, with toad streamers uh, because of the production facilities to get in, we see increasing demand for <coughs> in the industry. And in general, where you need better, res excuse me, where you need better resolution uh, from your PP data, uh, under sort of, uh, overhangs, where you need a, a different um, source and receiver location in order to actually get the, the energy down into, into this target close to, the, close to the salt, or where you need better bandwidth from the data itself. 